You're listening to Five Things with Lisa Birnbach. Hi, I'm Lisa Birnbach, and these are the five things that make life better. Wait, it's July? Are you kidding? All right, if you say so. Everywhere I go, and that's in the virtual sense, I talk to people about race. They may bring it up, or I might bring it up. I'm thinking about skin color and why I haven't thought more about skin color until now. I know it's white privilege, but still you would think as an urban dweller, I would have. We white people have not understood the exhaustion implicit in being a person of color in this country. The strain of every day navigating in the world. I am trying to add that equation to thinking about life as a Black person, and I will continue to think about this and work on it. Meanwhile, at headquarters, I am reading a lot because, you know, publishing has not stopped during the pandemic, and I am also trying in the most pathetic way imaginable to do some crafting while I'm listening to podcasts or watching the news. And as my cooking and baking have improved, my knack for knitting and and embroidery have gone way down. Who knows? But I am baking, and you will see on my website on lisabernbach.com, the first time I ever really baked, it was when I had my braces removed and Dr. Boylan, my orthodontist, had requested that I bring him a cake to celebrate. I think because I had braces for about five years or so. Anyway, that was the last time I baked until now. So you can see that. My guest this week is filmmaker and writer Susanna Styron, who I've known casually for a couple of years, but I discovered that she had made a film about migraines, and that film is called Out of My Head. And I really wanted to talk to her and see the film because I have discovered that I too suffer from migraine, not migraines, migraine. And the number of people for whom this is an issue seems to have grown exponentially, or we're more open about it, or symptoms of it that we thought were part of something else turn out to be collected in the world of migraine. It is a prevalent disease, more in women than in men, and it is maybe something that those of you who suffer from it are feeling even more of during this summer of COVID and Black persecution. So I might feel a migraine coming on, and you might too. So this film is worth watching. First, my five things. Okay, number one, I got my hair done. I'm a little defensive about this because it makes me sound vain or silly or my priorities wrong, but my mom has been asking me about getting her hair done for about four four months. She's her her reality, her attachment to reality is growing a little undone. And it just seemed like we could have an adventure because my wonderful hair colorist has a salon in Connecticut. And Connecticut was open before New York. And we could have a day and we did. And my exhibit C came along and the three of us you know, it was bonding. It was fun. Angela Cosmi, the salon in Connecticut, was really open. We were the only customers. Everyone had masks and gloves, us, them. The door was open. The windows were open. It was just, it was just lovely. Do we feel better since we got more sleek and and groomed? A hundred percent. Yes. Okay. I admit it. Number two, rhubarb. Is it a fruit? Or is it a vegetable? Well, actually, it's a vegetable that behaves like a fruit. I'm not sure I understand what that means, but I can back that up by experience. It looks like it's that thing in the in the market that looks like a pink celery. It looks like a celery gone bad, but it's so good. It's tart, but it is not like a lemon. It pairs beautifully with other fruits, and it becomes the umami of fruits in a way. You can't eat it raw, but you can cook it, and now I'm baking with it, 
And I have much more about this on my website, including the two recipes that I've tried. One thanks to my food twin, Marsha, and one that I found when I failed at Marsha's recipe the first time. Number three, the Lincoln Project. This is an, a nonprofit that was founded last December by some very committed Republicans, including George Conway, the lawyer, Steve Schmidt, Rick Wilson, John Weaver, Jennifer Horn, and others. Its purpose is to prevent Trump and Trumpism from prevailing in the 2020 elections. As we all know, Abraham Lincoln was a Republican, and his his mission as president, as the Civil War destroyed this country, was to knit the nation back together. And that is what the Lincoln Project aims to do. You may have seen some of their commercials on TV. They are tough. They are they're really tough. They are tougher on Trump than Joe Biden is likely to ever be. But you know, it's it's Republicans talking to Republicans and about Republicans. And by the way, who cares about partisanship now? Because Republicans are not Republicans in the classic sense. They are cult members of Donald Trump. I realize that since 2017, I follow a lot of Republicans and I admire them and respect them. It's not about that. It's about lawlessness, which is now part of what this country is about. And um, so I support the Lincoln Project with my own money. And I think it's just a great organization and doing some very heavy lifting. Number four, it has been announced that Stissel, the TV series, is coming back for a third season. Now, if you've been listening to this podcast for a while or reading the blog for a while, you know I love Stissel. And P.S., don't I deserve some credit for my restraint for not mentioning this as number one? Stissel is an international sensation. Now it's been seven years since its debut. There are only two seasons so far, but over time, People around the world have discovered it and loved it. Stissel is the family name of the family at the center of the, of the series. If I tell you once, I'll tell you a million times. Ignore the fact that they are super ultra-Orthodox Jewish family in their black coats and their black hats and their wigs, and they're speaking Hebrew or Yiddish. When you watch the series, you could be watching the people who live next door to you in, uh, I don't know, Ann Arbor, Michigan. It is so real. It is so nuanced. The family dynamics amongst this family are the same, although more accelerated because of all their rules than any other family. It's coming back. Now is a good time to catch it if you haven't seen it because there are 24 episodes and what else do you have to do? Number five, Dr. Anthony Fauci. We haven't seen him in a few weeks and don't make the mistake that by not seeing him, things are getting better. As you know, they're not. Our federal government has not developed a uniform policy, and therefore every state was posited against every other state, and we're all in it, you know, by ourselves, not really together. Some people deny that this disease exists. Now the states that were opening are closing. The U.S. is now, in Anderson Cooper's words, a pariah state. We are banned from entering the European Union as of today, as of July. What would we do without Dr. Fauci? I, I don't even want to think about it. Coming up next, filmmaker Susanna Styron. Don't go away. My guest today is filmmaker Susanna Styron. She and her partner, Jackie Oakes, made a documentary called Out of My Head, The Movie, which is about migraine. And I found the film interesting. And spoiler, I do suffer from migraine myself. And I've also learned from the film, it's migraine, not migraines. Susanna, thank you so much for joining us this morning. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. I, I found the movie both uplifting, terrifying. I found it fascinating that when your daughter, Emma, began to suffer from 
in her case, truly debilitating headaches, that uh, you became the warrior mom. Yeah, well, I think I was already the warrior mom, but this gave me uh-huh. a kind of a more active, visible war. I mean, you know, I think we all, you know, go to bat for our children, particularly when they're sick and when there's no easily available answer or plan for helping them. You know, we we go into kind of overdrive. Yes. I mean, if you're a real mother, emotionally, that's what happens. Yeah. And with your daughter, Emma, when did the migraine start and when was she first diagnosed? Okay. So it started when she was 14 and, but, but, but it was very bizarre because she had one month apart, she had two bouts of what she could only describe as blindness. I mean, she couldn't see. It was, it was partial blindness. She had peripheral vision and it, and it lasted for, I don't know, maybe an hour. And then it passed and she was dizzy and, you know, had to go to sleep. The first time I thought, you know, she just got her first period. It's her body's changing and she's an adolescent. It's just, that's what it is. When it happened again, I kind of freaked out and I, um, I actually, it was on a weekend and I made an emergency call to our ophthalmologist, and, you know, freaked out saying that Emma right. couldn't see. Can't see. Yeah. yeah. And he said, I think she might be having a migraine. And I said, what are you talking about? She doesn't have a headache. It has nothing to do with that. And he said, believe me, bring her in tomorrow and, you know, we'll, we'll see. So I took her in the next day and he examined her and he said, yeah, I'm sure this is migraine. And he sent us to a neurologist. And that's when I learned, and this is one reason that now the language has shifted from migraines to migraine. Mm -hmm. It is a comprehensive neurological disease. It's a disease called migraine. Migraines implies or reinforces the illusion that it's headaches. And Mm -hmm. excruciating headaches are definitely the most common symptom of migraine, but they are not the only symptom and they are not always a symptom that someone has. There's a whole host of of neurological sensory experiences that people can have. In the film, you discuss migraine with a whole slew of both sufferers and experts. And I was really shocked when one of the doctors in Massachusetts at one of the Harvard hospitals said, it's the first or second most common reason children are brought to the emergency room? Yeah, well, you know, in children, it has all sorts of really different manifestations, one of which is abdominal migraine, which is fairly common in children, where the the pain actually happens in the abdomen and not in Mm -hmm. the head. So they think that children, you know, have some appendicitis or something. The pain can be so bad. I ended up in the emergency room. Actually, I didn't know this. I I didn't make this association until I was making the film. And I learned about abdominal migraine in children because migraine tends to run in families. And so when we, when Emma was finally diagnosed and we went to a neurologist, she, you know, asked who in, in our family had migraine. And no, I said there no one, because I hadn't heard about it in our family on either my side or her father's side. But as I, when I learned about abdominal migraine, I realized that I had in fact suffered from it for several years in my adolescence and teenage years, I was, I ended up in the emergency room with the most excruciating stomach pain. I cannot describe the only pain I've had that's more intense is labor right? Wow, um, and delivery. And nobody was able, I didn't have appendicitis. I, you know, I would be vomiting I would, and then it would go away. And it was never, I never had a diagnosis. I was tested up and down and inside out. And it happened several times over several years. And then it stopped. So I had never heard of that until I saw the movie, but it's, it makes sense that there is a connection between you and your daughter. And because migraine is a condition that has manifold manifestations, it's, it's the same disease, but it isn't, but it is. Similarly, I had two, two bouts when I was in my twenties with aura, 
Mm. which is something we should talk about. So I didn't have a headache at first. I saw little spots in the immediate vicinity in a bar or a restaurant with my editor at the Village Voice. And I remember thinking to myself, I know hygiene among some of the editors isn't great, but do you think she really has flies? And then (laughs) boom, I had a headache and uh, a very bad headache. And then I had another one and then I never had one again. In the meantime, my youngest daughter was diagnosed as a maybe 10-year-old with migraines. It was heartbreaking to me. And lo and behold, guess who has migraine again? C'est moi. Uh. And all of our migraines are different. And mine was diagnosed a few years ago, I think coinciding with Donald Trump (laughs) becoming president. And honestly, Susanna, I don't feel they're bad headaches. They're really bad, but they're nowhere near as severe as what you have shown both with your daughter and with the many uh, volunteers who talked about their illness on camera. Yeah. I mean, it's apparently, I have not experienced it myself. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say, but apparently it's just, you know, like having a spike rammed through your brain or your eyeball or however, wherever the pain Mm -hmm. um, focuses or manifests. And yeah, the thing is, I mean, one reason it's so difficult to treat and often difficult to diagnose is that it is different in everyone. Everyone manifests their symptoms differently. And the thing is, Some treatments work for some people and they don't work for other people. You can have a treatment work for you and then it'll stop working because it's kind of ever evolving. They can spontaneously go away and as happened with you, they can spontaneously come back. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. There are just, it's so, it's one of the scientists in the film calls it a moving target. Yes, Um, yes. There used to be a wives' tale about migraine that my mother used to say, oh, you have a migraine, you must hate your mother. Oh, my God. Have you ever heard that? that? No. I guess my mother mother did. trying to make you feel guilty. (laughs) No, that that wasn't even about me. I mean, that was, there was, that was one thing she had heard. She had heard that it affects women way more than it it affects men. But you have- but you have many men in the film yeah. who have suffered migraine. Yeah. And also, there is a beauty to migraine, right? You talk about the creative um, uh, jolt it gives many artists and creative people. Yes. I mean, that was well, a... Re- uh, well, not like it's a bonus, but it's a little bit of a silver lining, I guess. Well, it was it's- really interesting to discover the connection between migraine and creativity. And that there are a lot of, we, we interview some artists in the film, um, mm-hmm. and then there's a sort of a, a bit of a history of it. But there are creative people who often feel this kind of burst of creativity after about with migraine. And apparently, Thomas Jefferson suffered from migraine. And apparently, he wrote the Declaration of Independence in this burst of creativity after like a five-week migraine. After, Um, not during. No, after. After. It's like you come out of it and there's all of this creative energy. And then the other, another interesting thing was that Lewis Carroll had migraine. And actually the, and we talk about this in the film, what happens to Alice when she goes to Wonderland is basically a description of a long migraine. I mean, many of the the experiences she had mimic symptoms of migraine. And there's even a part, so Aura, you were mentioning Aura. Aura Mm -hmm. is all of the different sensory symptoms that people have like not Emma's was actually when she told me she couldn't see she was actually experiencing Having aura, an aura and mm-hmm. and it meant that everything it wasn't like it went black in front of her it was like there was the little spots you had it was like one big spot that just made mm-hmm. everything disappear so there are other sensory auras and there's something called Alice in Wonderland syndrome. That is mm. what it's called in the, in the, in, in, by doctors and scientists. 
And it's when people have a particular form of migraine aura that makes them feel like they're getting really, really, really tall or really, really, really small. That's incredible to (laughs) me. Incredible to me. In the last few years, new medications have been introduced to market. And I think it may be because migraine is such a, affects such a large population or a large percentage of the population. So, so yes, people now are given Botox to help mitigate the pain. There are all kinds of new injectable medications. Uh, on the one hand, it feels like nobody's paying attention to migraine. And on the other hand, it feels like there's a, a large commitment on behalf of pharmaceutical companies and researchers to to work on it. What is the truth about that? Is it well, somewhere I, in between? Yeah, I think for a long time, it's been sort of ignored and minimized and certainly underfunded, partly because it is seen as a women's disease. And, you know, typically and historically, diseases of women are given less attention and less right. priority than diseases that affect men. Now, it does affect men. because I mean, first of all, nearly a billion people worldwide experience migraine. 38 million Americans have migraine. You know, one in five households in the world is affected by my, either it has someone in it with my, oh migraine. My, yes. So, uh-huh. but... That said, 75% of migraine sufferers are women. It does tend to affect women more than men. That doesn't mean it doesn't affect men with those huge right. numbers, as you see in the in the film. Why have the pharmaceutical companies woken up to it recently? I don't really know. But there is a new class of drugs. I mean, up until you know, like a year ago, there was only one medication, one class of medication at all that had been formulated specifically for migraine. And those were called the the triptans. Those are triptans. Uh Then 25 years passed without any other treatment. And there were variations on the triptans. You know, different pharmaceutical companies made their own different versions. They abort migraine. They don't prevent it. Mm -hmm. Um, So you take them when you you get one. They don't work for everybody. They can have really bad side effects. There is one medication which Emma took, which she talks about in the film, which we don't name in the film because we don't name any medications Mm -hmm. in the film. We've kept it completely independent from any association from anything commercial, any pharmaceutical companies. But I mean, I can tell you here, it's called Topamax. And it was a preventive. It was the only option she had for preventing her migraines at the time. And she took it and it to, to quite ill effect, ultimately, which you see in the film. Which you see, yeah. yeah. But there's a new, a new class of drugs called CGRP inhibitors, which functions completely differently from the triptans has recently come on the market and there are like four or five pharmaceutical companies that are that are making it now and it's a preventive so you take you know you you take it regularly i'm not sure exactly how, i think it's injected and i don't know how often like once a month or something you have to have what's called chronic migraine in order to qualify to take that and chronic migraine is 15 or more days a month mm-hmm. of migraine um mm, what so, a life that would be yeah yeah. yeah, And they've, there's been some really good success with them. They don't work for everybody, et cetera, as always. But it it's kind of a new hope. So I think the pharmaceuticals are really pushing it now. And that's why you may be seeing more ads, more publicity, right. more conversations about it. But also, I think if migraine had been stigmatized because it was a, a another one of those women's hysterical diseases like Epstein-Barr or whatever, maybe the stigma is at least, you know, sort of uh, disappearing and there is some impetus to now work on this. I mean, many years ago, I think it was 1985, my father had a horrible stroke. I guess there's no such thing as a good stroke, but his was pretty severe. And I was always amazed at the detail that his neurologist knew about my father's brain. Hmm. And conversely, how many times in a conversation the doctor would say, we don't know. 
Mm. I mean, if you know this, yeah. how can yeah. you know not right. know that? Right, right. You know, yeah, why so- are you studying what Schadenfreude looks well, like in an FM, whatever it's called, FMRI. functional MRI, FMRI? When, like, who cares when people have strokes and aneurysms that you can't, or migraine that you can't fix? Well, I so. I, I feel like the brain is kind of the new or maybe the last frontier for the human race. Mm-hmm. And we're just mm-hmm. baby steps down the path. I mean, there's so much to be discovered and to be understood. And there's, you know, the technology is beginning to be developed, like fMRI, functional MRI, where you can actually see the brain in action, not just mm-hmm. like still photographs of it. You can actually see it moving and ha- and changing. In response to a stimulus or a... Or a- words or pictures. Or, or just or, what it's doing. Yeah. I mean, uh-huh. the, the one reason migraine is so difficult to study is because, you know, the chances of getting somebody in an MRI machine while they're having an active migraine are very, very slim. For one thing, you know, they're so unpredictable. You never know when they're going to come on. And when you have one, you're not going to say, okay, put me in an MRI. I'll come over. Yeah. I'll come over yeah. now for your experiment. So, I'll come over for your experiment <laughs> while you make a hammering sound that right. wants, makes me want <laughs> right. to pull my skin off. Yeah, Exactly, exactly. But, you know, as far as you, you mentioned stigma, I hope the stigma is disappearing. I mean, this is one of the reasons we, my partner Jackie Oaks and I wanted to make this film. I mean, there were several reasons, but the stigma attached to this, I mean, it's it's one reason I had to like go on this exploration and make a yeah. film to understand what was happening to my daughter because it it is stigmatized and partly because it's seen as like being a sissy and a, wom- a women's disease. Oh, you're just being weak. And also because of the total inadequacy of the term headache when you're talking about migraine. But I thought I didn't know anybody who got migraines, but I did. You know, as yes. soon as I as soon as I started talking about Emma, people said, oh yeah, I get them too. Yeah, I get them too. And I suddenly realized like there, there was this whole closeted population of people suffering in isolation and hiding it and feeling bad about themselves and not being able to function and people not believing them. And it was happening to my daughter too. And I was like, and there was no film about it. You know, there was no documentary right. film about it to like go here, here's what's going on. And I kind of couldn't believe it. So, you know, I hope that this film will help, especially as people who suffer are able to show it to their loved ones and their friends and family and uh, co-workers. I mean, the the pushback people get at work when they have to go home because they have a migraine and people think, you know, it's just a headache. Then they're, you know, they're being so weak about it. I mean, we have a guy that's like, he's sitting down. You can't see that this beautiful big man is like six four, and he's talking about you oh, know, the writer around on the. F- no, he's it's his name is Keith. He's no, he's. The writer is Andy Levy, who's also a wonderful, you know, knows the whole history of it. He suffers, but the guy who says, you know, I, but people didn't believe me when I said I couldn't come in because of a oh, yeah. headache. And I said, well, I would be writhing around on the floor if I came in. And he, he, he looks, the guy looks invincible and he literally like rolls up in a ball and weeps when he has a migraine. Well, I think also, as you point out, because the symptoms are different. Maybe some people, without seeing your movie, don't even know that what they have and suffer silently right. is migraine right. or neurologically connected. Yeah, I mean, you know it's important to see it. We, we've had screenings all over the world over the past couple of years. Now it's out on DVD and streaming. But uh, during you know at our screenings, we have had people come up to us and go, "I have migraine. I didn't know it." Or this is what my child is going through. I didn't know it. But the but the most gratifying thing at these screenings and when people see it, however people see it, is we've gotten so much feedback from people saying, well, I mean, like I've had people come up to me, total strangers at screenings, hug me, weeping, saying, Mm -hmm. somebody finally understands I felt so alone. Or say, I showed this to my husband and he finally understands what I'm going through. And we even had um, a neurologist who was a headache specialist come up to us after a screening and say, I treat migraine. I don't have it myself. 
this is the first time that I really understand what my patients are going through. Wow. Yeah. Good job, Susanna. Mm. Really, it's a public service, the film. Could you just, before we get to your five things, could you just tell us how people can access the movie? Yes. Thank you. So our website has all of the information about buying, renting, and screening it. Um, And our website is www.outofmyheadfilm.com out of my head film.com. Um, we Great. are the, it's also available on Amazon and our distributor is Kino Lorber. So it's available on Kino now, but our website has all the information on it. Excellent. And we will link to your website Great. from our website at Lisa Uh, lastly, how's Emma doing? She is much better. She's much better. But interestingly, her, so there's a whole part in the film about the gut brain connection. And that's partly the, the, you know, the abdominal, abdominal migraine issue in children has to do with the fact that there's a whole nervous system in the gut. That yes, is, which yeah. I never heard about before. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. She, her, she no longer gets headaches, but she has something called IBS, which is irritable bowel syndrome, which is another inadequate term for an, an illness. But it's a digestive disease, basically, which we think is what her migraine has morphed into. So she deals with that on a daily basis, but she doesn't have headaches or aura anymore. Oh, poor thing. Yeah. I must say... You you bring up IBS, and it turns out 40% of all the people you know have it. It's just one of those other huh. things that people don't like to talk about because yeah. they don't want you to not invite them somewhere because they're going to have to go to the bathroom a lot, or they don't know if they're <laughs> going to flare. Or I mean, yeah. you live with it. Um, she, has, she has her symptoms completely managed with a specific diet. The only thing that's a pain with her is how limited her, you know, it's hard going out to a restaurant. And now that she's quarantining with me, she has to do all the cooking (laughs) because Uh she knows what she can eat. Yeah. Uh, uh, But it is manageable. It is manageable if you get the right treatment. I'm so glad. Okay. Susanna Styron, this is your life. (laughs) Your five things that make life better for you. Number one, coffee. I'm very particular about my coffee. I like dark roast and I have fresh beans and I grind them every morning and I make them. I only drink like two cups in the morning and one in the afternoon, but it's the morning coffee that's like, you know, it makes bed worth getting out of. It's just like <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'm with you there. That's excellent. Um, I am number two. My daughter and her partner quarantining with me. So Emma Um, and her partner, Wade, live in Brooklyn, in Flatbush. And finally, after two weeks of them isolating themselves because they didn't want to get me sick, I convinced them. It was like really, it was the... It was the very end of March, and it was really kind of freakout time in New York City, and I convinced them to come out and stay with me, and I went and picked them up um, in my car and brought them out here, and they've been here for almost three months now, which has been great. I'm really lucky that I have enough space in the house that Emma grew up in that they can be here, and they can each have their own little workspace because they're both working remotely. And I would say my favorite thing about it, aside from having, you know, really kind of the best company, is how much they make each other laugh. And I can just sit in one end of the house and hear them laughing in another part of the house. And it just makes my heart sing. Oh, that is so nice. I have wanted my kids to be with me since this happened, the pandemic. And it just feels like a second you know, a bonus round of parenting oh. or not parenting, but, you know, togetherness that oh. a lot of people are enjoying. It's amazing. And I, it's, it's such a gift and I hate to be happy about something when so many people are suffering, but I feel like it's this precious time that I would never have had otherwise. And I will never have again. And Mm. I mean, I, my other daughter is stuck in California and I haven't seen her in three months and I can't 
bear it, but she's well taken care of. And her brother is there too, and they're fine. But so it's, it's such a balm to my heart to have, have Emma here. Oh, I bet. I bet. Uh, number three. Heather Cox Richardson. Do you know who she is? I do not. Okay. So she is a historian at Harvard who has a daily newsletter about what's going on in the world. It is kind of a brilliant, astute distillation of kind of what happened each day in our country, and particularly in the Trump administration. And she often knows stuff before other people do. Like I read, sometimes I read, I wake up in the morning and her newsletter's in my inbox and I read it and I find out about the firing of Berman, for instance. Oh, wow. Uh, that was the first place I, I mean, she has stuff like before the New York Times. She's um, wired. <laughs> she is so, and she's so smart and so interesting. And especially when you like can't take the news anymore, she's kind mm-hmm. of a safe way to find out what's going on and not necessarily want to slit your throat. (laughs) Oh, that's fantastic. I will definitely check her out. Thank you. Yeah. Number four. Large bodies of water. Mm. I was very lucky to grow up in the summers on Martha's Vineyard. My mother lives there now year round. Mm -hmm. And so I get to spend time there on the water. And the ocean has always been, you know, a really important part of my life. I'm a Pisces. I don't know anything about astrology, but I know I'm a Pisces, (laughs) and that's a fish. (laughs) Maybe that's why water is so essential to me. But when I moved to the house I'm in now, which is across the street from the Hudson River, one of my requirements, really anywhere I live, would be to be near a large body of water so I can look at it, I can hear it, I can smell it. The great thing about the Hudson River is that it's tidal. It has Mm -hmm. tides, it's brackish, so the seawater comes in. It sometimes smells like the ocean, and it has waves when it's windy. And it's just so, and I can look out at it and just zone out. There's something so calming and hypnotic and such a salvation about all of the senses bringing in large bodies of water. I think if you were raised near water, it's something that you almost, without realizing, find out you can't really live yeah. without. Yeah. Um, not that it's the only way to live, but I used to live, I raised my children on the East River, not on the river, not in a raft, but in a, an apartment that overlooked it. And I could spend hours staring at the water yeah. and wonder whether there was something wrong with me that I found that so <laughs> satisfying. Only I could turn it into a negative. Um, <laughs> number five. Um, number five. And by the way, these are not in any order of preference. They just right. happen to be how I jotted them down <laughs> and sent them to you. Uh, I think that's, yeah, I think putting them in in preference is way too hard. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, Protest. So I, you know, when I was a child, my mother took me to marches against the Vietnam War, and that was so life-changing for me. And I have, in this moment in particular, watching um, and sometimes being a part of the, when I can, the, in this isolation and uh, where I am, um, being part of the Black Lives Matter protest, watching the power of it is just, is, it's such a reminder. I mean, it sucks that it's taken, the, you know, it's not the only time this has happened and it sucks that it's taken this long, but it's so wonderful that the momentum that's built in this protest is what changes the world? I mean, it's always been like the fact that even in this, you know, kind of to- wannabe totalitarian government we're increasingly living in, that it's still fundamentally up to us to make the change. And that if enough people get together and express their desires, that change can be made is an extraordinary thing. And the fact that we can still protest in this country, which sometimes feel like feels like even that could be endangered is, you know, just kind of the most important thing that we need to hold on to and keep 
doing. I also appreciate that so many of the protests that seem to be really affecting change are started by young people. Yes. Uh, I think about Greta Thunberg and the the crowds and the awareness she's been able to harness. And I think about the kids at Parkland. Yeah. And, and, and the also, war. I mean, that was, yes, you know, that, that was, was the youth movement. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. yeah. No, I think that's a great list. And Susanna, your film has truly been revelatory for me. I've learned what to be afraid of next <laughs> as my migraine meanders around my brain. And I also think it's just an extremely helpful film to really understand the power and the mystery of the brain. Fascinating. Thank you so Thank much you. for coming and sharing it. Thank you. You've been listening to Five Things That Make Life Better with me, Lisa Birnbach. My guest this week has been Susanna Styron, filmmaker of the documentary Out of My Head about migraine disease. You can follow the film at its website at outofmyheadfilm.com. You can follow the film on Facebook at The Migraine Project, on Twitter at The Migraine Project, and Instagram, Out of My Head The Film. You can subscribe to this podcast almost anywhere that you can get a podcast. Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play Music, YouTube, iHeartRadio, and possibly your kitchen toaster oven. My blog is at lisabernbach.com. You'll find links to Susanna's film and to all the things, five things, 10 things that we've talked about today. This podcast is produced in New York City by thefieldtv.com. My engineer is Kevin Watkins. My team is Espresso Arucci, Michael Port, Boko Haft, and Sam Haft. Until next week, wear a mask and act natural. Bye-bye. That was Five Things with Lisa Bernbach. New episodes every Friday, if she remembers. 